Web 1.0, Web 2.0, and now Web 3. Will we ever stop? Probably not. But uh, rather than just being a marketing gimmick or a hype creation machine, Web 3 is going to represent an important evolution of what we can do on the internet. And even if it is going to take some time to fully blossom, you have to start paying attention now. My name is David Orban, and this is The Context. When the internet was born, it was for uh, academic researchers, uh, for technologists, specialists that really cared about uh, the intricate details of protocols, how to connect computers between them, what would be the winning architecture, and everyone outside of their closed circle ignore them. Even with the growth of the internet uh, in the 70s, the 80s, when thousands of computers were already connected, still it required a lot of uh, knowledge of how to do things, even something as simple as uh, decoding the attachment of an email, something that today uh, even the less uh, sophisticated, the least sophisticated of uh, internet users uh, does uh, every day. But then, with the introduction of the World Wide Web, and especially uh, the first browsers, the Mosaic browser, it had become possible for non-specialists to roam the uh, digital superhighway. The first uh, websites were uh, simply the display of information that you would read, and then there would be a hyperlink somewhere, and you clicked on it, and you read another page on the same website, or maybe uh, magically, uh, you would jump on another website to read the information there. This kind of uh, static connection of uh, uh, web pages and websites together was already a huge improvement on uh, information retrieval, how information could be gathered. And then, um, at the turn of the millennium, the concept of Web 2.0 uh, was born, which was the uh, understanding that uh, uh, web pages and websites could and should display information much more dynamically, and that this information wasn't necessarily only uh, to be absorbed by the users, uh, but the users could indeed enrich the, this information with their own text and images and soon videos. And this information that was enriching the websites could be correlated, displayed to others, and others could react to them. And this is how uh, what is now part of the daily life of many of us uh, the series of web services uh, was born, whether social networks or uh, video uh, sharing websites uh, or uh, the e-commerce uh, platforms, uh, where, for example, we uh, know that we can rely on a product to be um, fit for the purpose that we want to fulfill, because of the reviews that users have submitted. And each of these 
services that emerged in the Web 2.0 paradigm turned out to be centralized. The original architecture of the internet was peer-to-peer, -peer. but uh, that architecture uh, didn't last because uh, it became very rapidly evident that the users didn't want to maintain their own uh, complex infrastructure. They wanted to take advantage of the features and uh, the benefits that the internet provided without the complications. So this unbalance uh, strengthened the servers and weakened the clients. Very few uh, normal users keep web servers on-premise, where they have to maintain it, update it, secure it. Uh, they have to make sure that it doesn't uh, lose any data, that uh, the energy is constantly uh, available uh, through uninterruptible power supplies, and the data is backed up, and then it can be restored if uh, a hard disk is corrupted and, and uh, uh, the original copy is, is lost and so on and so forth. No one wants to do that, and that is why uh, the cloud services that reliably can uh, provide email access, for example, via Gmail, uh, or e-commerce services via Amazon, or even the backbones of the virtual servers, computers that pretend to exist, but in reality they are running on other, even more powerful computers, have become the dominating paradigm. There have been many, many advantages to this. For example, an internet startup today doesn't have to worry about so many things. When uh, Netscape was born, they were spending millions of dollars in software licenses. They were spending tens of millions of dollars in bandwidth. Uh, at a given point, Netscape became inaccessible to the world because um, some road work cut their internet connection and the backup connection wasn't working either. Well. A startup today has uh, the ability to set up in a few hours or a few days a server infrastructure uh, on the Amazon cloud uh, or any other cloud from Microsoft, from Google, even Alibaba, and not having to worry about the security, for example, of those servers or uh, the provisioning of energy or communication and bandwidth, it can just keep growing with the growth of the demand from their users. So, this is just one example, but there are so many. Of course, all of us know uh, the uh, attractiveness uh, and uh, the supposed dangers of uh, social media as well. Now, the downside is clear. A complete lack of control of everyone, including those who want to build the next generation of solutions that could disrupt Google and Facebook and Amazon all of us, both users and startups and growing technology companies, depend completely on this centralized infrastructure. The next paradigm, Web3, promises to rebalance this by allowing the execution of scalable solutions that do not depend on a centralized control, but still promise to hide from the end user the complexity of the 
features and uh, provide the benefits in a very easy to use uh, operation and provide an exciting set of tools for the startups and the developers who will build in the knowledge that they cannot be exploited, they, they cannot lose control over their own creation through the shenanigans and the, the uh, tricks of the technology giants, which today happens very, very often. None of this is yet possible. Web3 is mostly a promise, is mostly a dream. But it is an important dream. And when enough people dream to achieve something, well, uh, there is no guarantee, but oftentimes iterating towards it, making a lot of mistakes, but improving over and over, they achieve that dream. We have dreamed about uh, the ability of streaming high definition movies in millions of homes. And today it is possible, whether it is YouTube or Netflix or so many other streaming services today, well, what uh, has been only a dream uh, is now possible. And uh, the uh, abundance of the choices that we have uh, for really good movies or uh, TV series, if we want to watch them, uh, is uh, almost uh, without limit. The dream of Web3 of a better balance and the distributed and decentralized control of the information, of unstoppable services that are both reliable as well as they are a platform for empowerment and emancipation of billions of people, is going to take time to fully develop. Maybe 10 years, but we are already seeing the glimpses of Web3 in blockchain technologies, in uh, the um, certainly overhyped uh, NFT uh, uh, fad that is uh, laying the grounds of uh, solutions that will persist and will be important uh, through the metaverse that will definitely not uh, be the realm uh, controlled and owned by, by Facebook. By uh, so many exciting new projects that are uh, being uh, experimented today. The most important component of Web3 is the challenge of a digital identity that is reliable, but is also flexible. Our digital identity must have multiple facets. If I need to be identified with my traditional passport, so be it. But if I want to be pseudonymous, uh, on um, some uh, new platform that gathers uh, to one of my uh, passions, uh, well, I should be able to do so. And finally, I should also have the right to be anonymous. This flexible identity system doesn't exist yet. And it is going to be a cornerstone of Web3 applications. There are other components as well. And uh, based also on your feedback, I will be happy to analyze them and to share my understanding of their evolution with you. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Context. Uh, it is always a pleasure to think together with you. If you want to support uh, my efforts, you can do so very easily by going to patreon.com slash David Orban and joining others uh, who want to hear more uh, week after week 
of what is going on in our world, why it matters, and why you should pay attention. Thank you.